Okay, good morning, everybody. How are you? Are you good? So then let's start the second day. And I have to uh, admit, I have to start it with bad news. Uh, I know that yesterday you talked about all these interesting applications of heuristics in the real world. And today we have to resign to the laboratory again and we talk about one of the most boring environments there is about monetary gambles. And I don't know how you feel about monetary gambles, but uh, when I was a student, a graduate student, and uh, starting my career, whenever I came across monetary gambles, I fell asleep uh, immediately. I thought they are so boring, uh, abstract, content-free. Why would anybody worry about monetary gambles? Um, unfortunately, we need to talk about monetary gambles. And the reason is this. Uh, without monetary gambles or without the domain of monetary gambles, a lot of the most influential theories of choice wouldn't exist. If you think back to the beginning of expected value theory, it was uh, thinking about monetary gambles that brought Laplace and Fermi to uh, coming up with the notion of uh, mathematical expectation and expected value theory. And if you go back to the early 18th century, the St. Petersburg paradox, the St. Petersburg gamble, uh, was the gamble that brought uh, Daniel Bernoulli to invent something that today we know as expected utility theory. And think of cumulative prospect theory or prospect theory. Without gambles, we wouldn't have uh, this enormously influential theory, which is now applied in all kinds of domains. But originally, it was applied to monetary gambles. Uh, so what I think is that uh, we, it, it will be hard to make, well, you can make a case for heuristics, um, but it will not be fully convincing unlike, unless you also make it in the domain of monetary gambles, because it's here where the rationality war unfolds and where the important theories have been proposed. So for that reason, let's deal with monetary gambles. Um, what we also will do today, we will pick up on the theme from yesterday, namely the distinction between risk and uncertainty. Uh, and last but not least, I also want to bring you along on a journey through the history of behavioral science, which means that we will go back into the history because I think that without understanding some of the history, uh, you will not fully understand or fully appreciate the debate that uh, rages today between those people who have a relatively positive view of bounded rationality and those people who emphasize more the downsides of uh, bounded rationality. So we need to look also back into the history. Okay, uh, with no further ado, let's start. And let's start with a relatively old paper. And it's one of my most favorite um, beginnings of a paper. And let me read that beginning to you. Um, the, the authors here say, man, from that you can already tell it's a pretty old paper, right? Um, <laughs> Man must cope with an environment about which he has only fallible information. Quotation, while God may not gamble, animals and humans do, they cannot help but to gamble in an ecology that is of essence only partial, partially accessible, partly accessible to their foresight. Brunswick, 1955. And man, man gambles well. He survives and prospers while using the fallible information to infer the states of his uncertain environment and to predict future events. Now, there are three different people talking here. So there is, on the one hand, the authors. And I will ask you in a minute whether you think you recognize the authors. Then the author side, Brunswick. Uh, is Brunswick a name that is uh, familiar to you? Who has heard the name Brunswick? OK, so Brunswick is one of the great psychologists of the 20th century. And Brunswick, more than anybody else in the midst of the last century, thought about how the mind adapts to the probabilistic structure of the world. And he came up with a theory that he called probabilistic functionalism. Uh, and that was one of the most important theory that tries to understand the adaptation of the mind to the environment. If you get to read only five papers in psychology, during your career, read one of the Brunswick papers. Uh, it's not easy to understand, but it's incredibly um, insightful and forward-looking. So Brunswick is talking here. And Brunswick himself is also talking about another person. You recognize the famous quote by Albert Einstein, 
God doesn't gamble. So Brunswick says, yeah, maybe God doesn't gamble. What do I know? But certainly people have to gamble. Okay, and the authors of this abstract, uh, of this beginning, are who? Who are the authors of it? Anybody guesses? Who has written that? So these people are relatively optimistic about our ability to deal with an uncertain world. Who, who could that be? Any guesses? Nobody? Come on, a gu one guess at least. Please. Very good guess, but it wasn't Herbert Simon. But it's a good guess. Really? Okay. Interesting, interesting guess. Not a good one, but an interesting one. <laughs> good. No, it wasn't Kahneman uh, or Tversky. No. Also a good guess, but no, wasn't. No, <laughs> Einstein, no, Einstein uh, wasn't it either. Um, okay, so I take it that you may not know who the, uh, who, uh, who, who the authors of this papers. Think of the five papers that should be included in the set of five papers. So who was it? Uh, this paper was written in 1967 uh, by two authors, Cameron Beach, Beaters, uh, Peterson and Leroy Beach, and it was entitled Man as an Intuitive Statistician. So 1967, and here's what they really said and found. So what they did is they reviewed the empirical evidence that was collected in psychology mostly, but also in economics, about how people reason statistically and how well they deal with an uncertain world. And here's their main conclusion. What they say, based on, what they, on their review, it was a narrative review, it wasn't a meta-analysis, they say, in general, the results indicate that probability theory and statistics can be used as a basis for psychological models that integrate and account for human performance in a wide range of inferential tasks. In other words, what they are saying is that if you, as a modeler of human behavior, interested in how people make uncertain inferences, if you want to model that, start with models and theories of statistics and probability theory, because that's an excellent starting point. It's not the full story, but it's an excellent starting point. That was five years before this paper was written. This paper was written in uh, 1972, uh, and five years later, the world turned around. The world turned upside down, and there was a paper written by Kahneman and Tversky. It was one of their first papers in which uh, they arrived at the following conclusion. They argued, in his evaluation of evidence, man, again, it's an old paper, man is apparently not a conservative Bayesian. He is not Bayesian at all. And notice the, the word that they are using. He is not a conservative Bayesian. He is not a Bayesian at all. Not a conservative Bayesian is a reference to one of the people who contributed to the first set of results that was reviewed in Peterson and Beach, namely Ward Edwards. Ward Edwards is the founding father of behavioral decision research. He started out his career in the late 1940s and produced a lot of papers that went into the review by Peterson and Beach. And he concluded, among others, he concluded, people are actually pretty good in Bayesian reasoning. They are a bit too conservative. In other words, they stick too much to the priors and are not updating enough. But overall, they follow the prediction of the Bayesian model in a qualitative way really well. And what Amos, uh, what Amos Tversky and Danny Kahneman are telling Ward Edwards, and Amos Tversky was working in the laboratory uh, for some time of Ward Edwards, they are telling him, Ward Edwards, the great father of the founding father of behavioral decision research, they tell him, you're totally wrong. You're totally wrong. People are not even Bayesians. So in other words, within a few years, we have a totally different story, a totally different view on the human mind, where the assumption is people are using simplistic, simple heuristics, simplistic heuristics. They are quite good sometimes, but they also are error prone. They produce a lot of errors and biases, systematic and severe errors and biases. So in other words, within five years in psychology, we have a totally different view of the human mind. 
And the question that I'll pose to you, and I will not answer it right now, but if there's enough time, we go back to it in the, uh, in the, at the end of the talk. And a lot of the talk that I'm giving today has, all, has to do with that gap. The question that I would like to pose to you is, what happened? What happened? What happened that within a few years, we're accepting a quite different story about the human mind? In the, 40, in the 50s and 60s, we believe that people are really good, that statistics and probability theory is a good starting point to model human behavior when it comes to uncertainty. And in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and up to the present, we seem to believe the opposite. How is that possible? This is the first puzzle I wanted to pose to you. And here's the second puzzle. And this is also, if you will, it's a rationality gap of another kind that occurred much earlier, uh, much later in history. It's a gap that uh, actually we discovered recently uh, in a now meta-analysis, uh, and it's worked together with Dirk Wolf. Um, and what we did is that we did a meta-analysis on studies that deal with what we have called the description experience gap. And I will tell you about what that really means in a second, but let me first introduce you to this rationality gap. Now, one benchmark of rational behavior is making choices and monetary gambles that meet the criterion of expected value maximization. And what we found looking at many, many different studies is that in description-based studies, I'll tell you about that in a sec, um, we find that people are hardly described as expected value maximizers. In fact, uh, the level of maximization is hardly better than 50%. But once we move to experience, and you can distinguish between complete experience, which means people saw or experienced all the outcomes in the gambles, or incomplete experience where they only uh, experienced a subset of the potential outcomes. What we see is that in those two conditions, the maximization rate is substantially higher, 66% under complete experience and even 88% under incomplete experience. Why? How is that possible? Now, before we go to why that may be possible, uh, let me first introduce you to what I mean with description and experience. Now, here's one of the most famous description-based study in the history of decision science. This is a paper published in Econometrica by Maurice Allais. And I, 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 I assume that many of you know the name. Uh, he was one of the most outspoken critics of expected utility theory and the axiomatization of expected utility theory, and he showed empirically that a lot of choice behaviors of uh, people are inconsistent with expected utility theory. And this is decision from description. What I mean with that is that you see two choice situations, and you see that all the outcomes and all the probabilities are fully described. In other words, what I do as an experimenter, I give you all the information on a silver platter and ask you to make a choice. There's no learning, there's no search, um, there's no uncertainty. It's just risk. You know completely about the probability distribution and the outcome distribution. Now, what's interesting, if you look at contemporary psychology, but also partly in economics, but in particular in psychology, it seems that we all love to study decision from description. Here are a few examples, the LA paradox, the fourfold pattern of risk attitude, the certainty effect, the reflection effect, loss aversion, are all based on decision from description, in which we give all the information to the decision maker. The framing effect studies. Uh, if we try to measure people's risk preference in a hold and lorry tradition, is based on description. No learning, no search for information. And in fact, you could continue that countless studies on risky choice, on intertemporal choice, on Bayesian reasoning, on deductive reasoning, on moral reasoning, or causal reasoning, there's no uncertainty. There's no learning. All the information is given to you, and you make a choice. Now, here comes the interesting question. Is that how we make decisions in the real world? Perhaps not. Perhaps in the real world, nobody gives us the information on a silver platter but we have to learn, we have to look for information. And that raises the following question. To what extent does all these results hold in the real world? Or to what extent are these possible, not artifacts, but possibly restricted 
to the world of risk and a world in which we do not have to learn and in which we do not have to search for information, at least, at least not in a sequential way. Now, that, was, that very question was the starting point of three papers that were published in the early 2000s. And all these three papers, they wanted to know where, to what extent, when we study description experience in parallel, to what extent will it lead to the same choices or to systematically different choices? And of course, the underlying question was, are the results that we have, that we found in the laboratory, do they generalize to the real world? Do they generalize to uncertainty? Do they generalize to learning and information search? And what these papers found is what later has been called a description experience gap, which is the insight that there are systematic differences between description-based studies and experience-based studies. Now, how did that work? Let me quickly introduce to uh, different description and experience paradigms. So, in the world of risky gambles, you can generalize the difference also to uh, intertemporal choice, to moral reasoning, or to many other domains. But in the risky world, decision from description mean basically that we state the probabilities and we state the outcome, either in a written way or in some other symbolic, graphical way. Uh, what we then can do is we can present the same information also in a totally different way, namely in decision from experience. And what that means is that we take these same underlying gambles, but we don't tell people about it. Rather, what we give them are two urns. They are totally opaque. And then we ask them, sample from those urns, find out how the world look, looks like. And different paradigms have been used to do so. This is the sampling paradigm, where people basically get to sample uh, from these urns one time, two times, three times, as often as they want, in whatever direction they want. And only when they feel content, when they think, oh, I know now enough about these urns, they stop and they make a final choice. And what we as experimenters get to do now, we can compare that choice against this one. In principle, the information here, if they sample enough, is totally identical to the information here. And you can also, and this, by the way, is a sampling paradigm in which there is no exploration exploitation trade-off, because people can sample as long as they want without any costs except temporal time costs. But you can also make it costly. You can introduce the exploitation exploration trade-off by basically making every single sample performance contingent. In other words, it costs money. It already contributes to your final income. And the interesting thing is then you can compare the choice proportions here and here against the choice proportions here. And basically what has been done is that exactly, namely comparing the behavior in these experience-based paradigms against the behavior in the description paradigms. Okay, let me give you one example of how it really looks. So this is the sampling paradigm, and basically what people see is our two urns. They press the button and look what is the outcome, and there will be a random draw from the urn, and that is the monetary outcome. Uh, and through the seeing these outcomes, people can, if they want, form a representation of the underlying probabilities. They can sample as long as they want. They can go back and forth. But once they are content with uh, what they know, they stop. Uh, and then they make a final choice. And this final choice then is incentivized. So at this point, the person stops. This, you see the decision screen. They make a final choice. And that's it. So in other words, it's a very simple paradigm. But the difference is you don't get probability information, you need to infer the probability information from the sequence of outcomes, as it often is in the real world. Now, here's what we found. So what we did in this meta-analysis, we looked at many thousands of trials, experience-based and description-based, and what we found for a paradigm where you have a risky gamble with two or more outcomes against a safe gamble where you have a certain outcome, and that's the kind of gamble that is often used to measure risk preference, our risk preferences, that's the standard gamble we use, we found what we call a description experience gap. And what that means, it's a systematic difference between the choice proportion in description and experience. Uh, on average, the difference is about 20 percentage points. But as you can see, is the difference is a function of the true probability of the rarest outcome in the gamble. 
And if the rare outcome is very rare, you can see that this gap goes up, can even be up to 50 percentage points in some of these studies. In other words, this is a very substantial gap between description and experience. And you can, by the way, you can um, portray the description experience gap in the following way. The gap is as if people underweight rare events in decision form experience and overweight rare events in decision form description. Okay. Going back to this. So this is just a different illustration of this gap. And uh, it shows that, um, bringing, back, bringing the puzzle back, it shows that there is a higher maximization rate in experience than in description. And what we started wondering, why is that? Why is it that in experience people seem to uh, be more rational or more in accordance with maximization of expected utility than in description? Uh, there are different possible answers. But what I will propose to you is one possible answer. And this possible answer brings us back to heuristics. Uh, specifically, what we wondered is whether and what role heuristics could play in this distinction. Yes, please, go ahead. So, if I understand correctly, does that go against uh, the um, paradigm of prospect theory because there will be the, um, under the overweighting of small probabilities from description, there will be a prospect theory feature. But then the question, Oh, my class was, but then it doesn't really matter which kind of experience that is. Like, imagine that there's a super rare event that's really shocking, you know, like an avalanche, like, hits me, even if that's super rare. Wouldn't I then be totally, you know, I experienced that, and then I maybe overweight it uh, compared to another very rare event that, however, is not really important for me? That's a very good question. Um, let me rephrase it slightly so that you all hear it and that um, I'm all cabled up so that the, the, um, that the camera hears it. Um, so the, the question here is, once you experience the rare event, wouldn't then the opposite occur, that you are overweighting the rare event, uh, that because it's so mighty in your imagination? And indeed, that is correct. Uh, the evidence available seems to suggest, for instance, when people are involved in a car accident, uh, there is a time right at window of time window after the uh, event where they are very careful and seem to be overweight, act as if they overweight the likelihood of an accident to happen. But what then happens is that uh, with your experience, and the experience is that um, car accidents are rare, nothing happens, you go, you drive again. With the experience, you unlearn the rare event in a certain sense. In other words, you are reverting back to the possibly underweighting uh, probability pattern. Uh, so in other words, experience, that's very interesting. Experience is not static. Experience is dynamic, which also could lead to a dynamic change in the way you weight uh, rare events or events in general. Okay, uh, I promised you that we are going now to heuristic because we are thinking about this distinction. And that brings us back to another old piece of work. And I know there's one person uh, in the room who knows the author of this paper very well. The author of this paper is Warren Thorngate. Warren Thorngate in the 1980s wrote a paper about choice heuristics. The title of the paper was Efficient Decision Heuristics. <coughs> Remember, 1980s, uh, 1980s was in the midst of this new movement, in the midst of the time where everybody thought more about the downsides of heuristics, where everybody was concerned with the biases and mistakes that heuristics cause. That was the zeitgeist. Uh, and Warren Thornge did the following thing. What he did is that uh, he looked at 10 simple heuristics for preferential choice. These heuristics could be found in the literature. So he didn't invent them, but he found them in the literature. And he conducted what was one of the early computer simulations at the time. So he had a tournament in which he used randomly generated lottery uh, choices, and he wanted to know how good do the heuristics perform relative uh, to uh, expected value maximization. In other words, are heuristics so bad that we should totally give up on them, or could they pot possibly approximate expected value maximization? And here's the conclusion by Thorngate. What Thorngate says is, a wide variety of decision heuristics with, will usually produce optimal or close to optimal choice and can thus be termed 
relatively efficient. In other words, what Thorngate argued in the 1980, in 1980, is that, hold on, hold on a minute. Uh, despite all the heuristics and biases that, uh, the, despite all the biases that heuristics seem to be producing, I find in this simulation that heuristics are really good. Do you think that this paper received any attention? Uh, I yesterday went to uh, Google Scholar and looked up what the quotation, what the quotation, uh, the number of quotations of the paper. And what I found is that the paper wasn't completely ignored. The paper got 264 quotations. That's not bad. But if you compare it to Kahneman and Tversky, that was 1972. That was the paper where they argued people are no Bayesians at all. It has over 5,500 quotations. In other words, relative to the impact of the message that, errors, uh, that heuristics may be error prone, this message, Warren Thorngate's message, was mostly unheard. Okay, what I would like to do is uh, I tell you a little bit about the simulation and I, I'll restrict it to just two heuristics so that you have an idea what these heuristics are. So the first one, and that's the most important one because it's the most successful heuristic in the tournament, and it's also the one that will keep us a little bit busy for the rest of the talk, is this. It's called equiprobable heuristic. And basically, here you see a gamble that goes back to the LA paradox. You see uh, option A, 100 with one, with, with you get with certainty, or you can get 500 with a probability of 10%, 100 with 89%, and zero with 1%. And the question is now, how do you choose between these two options? And what equiprobable does is this. Equiprobable says, ah, let's forget about all the probabilities. We, we, we uh, treat all outcomes as if they are equally probable. And then what we do is we just basically add up the outcomes and so I, I look at all the outcomes, add them up, and then I choose the outcome, I, I choose the option which on average offers me the better outcome. So uh, option A offers 100, option E offers on average 200. It's clear? That means I take option B. So in other words, you have a heuristic that doesn't care about probabilities. It just cares about outcome. It's as if the probabilities don't exist or as if all the outcomes in the world are equal probable. Now, of course, you know that they are not equally probable. They are highly skewed in, uh, in the option B. Um, here's the worst heuristic uh, in the tournament by Thorngate. It's called the least likely heuristic. Uh, and what does the least likely heuristic does? The least likely heuristic says, well, let me first look at the worst thing that could happen. In option A, that's 100. It's also the best thing that could happen, but it's definitely also the worst thing. And in B, it's zero. And then once I know that, I look at their respective probabilities, which are I, one and, uh, and one percent. And the idea is that I want to pick the option that has the smallest probability of the worst outcome, which in this case also means I choose option B, right? Um, so again, this is a very simplistic uh, heuristic in the sense that a lot of information in between is totally ignored, as does the equiprobable, which ignores all the probability information. Now you may wonder, how good con could those heuristics even perform relative to expected value, which takes in all the information, multiplies the probabilities with the outcomes, and then arrives, uh, arrives at a choice. So what we look here is the performance of just these two heuristic in the so-called Thorngate environment. Thorngate environment means that the probability distribution and the outcome distribution is a rectangular distribution. So each outcome is equally likely to be drawn and each probability value is equally likely to be drawn. That was what uh, Thorngate used as the underlying environment. And what you see here is basically the percentage of the best highest expected value alternative chosen for equiprobable and the least likely. And what you see is that if there are two alternatives and uh, two, four, and eight outcomes per alternative, the performance is really good. It's up to 90%. That's not bad. I mean, it's not quite 100, but it's really good. Uh, but if we go down to four alternatives and eight alternatives, you see that the performance drops. The performance is still much better than the respective chance level, but you see it's not perfect performance. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, if we look at the accurate performance, you also see 
there's a pretty substantial price tag that you pay for using a heuristic and not expected value. You pay a price tag of 25 percentage points. So if you are investing in a stock market, that would be not a trivial difference. Um, that, that's pretty costly. Uh, but you also see it's not, it's not terrible, uh, but it's, so in other words, maybe Warren Thorngate overstated the case a little bit. Maybe they are not quite as optimal as they seem. Uh, here, even worse, if you use least likely, if you use least likely, then basically you are worse on average than chance. Okay, um, there are two uh, weaknesses in Thorngate's analysis. The first weakness is it's again still, it's the world of risk. It's the world of decision from description. There is no uncertainty. Nothing has to be learned. It's all given to you. That's one problem. The other problem is Thorngate didn't really think much about Simon Sisses. Simon Sisses, you remember, did it come up yesterday? Okay, Simon, so you, everybody knows Simon Sisses. The two plates that work together, the ecological and the cognitive plate. And Warren Thorngate didn't think about the, uh, the ecological plate. In other words, he didn't think about under what circumstances will a particular choice heuristic work well and when will it falter. So he didn't have yet uh, an, a Brunswickian or uh, a Simonian perspective on decision making. However, that changed. That changed with uh, another important piece of work. And this piece of work happened in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, and that was based on a book uh, which is called The Adaptive Decision Maker by John Payne, James Batman, and Eric Johnson. Who knows this book? OK. <laughs> uh, if you have to read five books, <laughs> <laughs> you may want to think about including this book. It's an important book uh, because it brought uh, into the discussion about heuristic the following idea. Uh, each strategy, so in, in, we have a repertoire of different decision strategies. And different decision strategies have different levels of accuracy they are, uh, achieve and different level, levels of effort. And the idea was that we can uh, make a rational accuracy effort trade-off. Idea being is that if I want to reduce my cognitive effort by using a heuristic, I take into account that the accuracy level goes down. But sometimes that's okay, because I'm not that worried about accuracy, but I'm worried about my cognitive effort. So basically, I can, by using different strategies, I can play with that accuracy effort trade-off. But here's an important point in that metaphor. The metaphor suggests and implies there is always an accuracy effort trade-off. In other words, if you use simpler strategies, you will pay a price, and the price is reduced accuracy. And that's an interesting question, whether or not that trade-off always holds, or whether there are circumstances under which you are actually getting both simplicity in the process and high accuracy. And I think that yesterday and possibly today, you see a couple of examples that maybe uh, that that trade-off may not is may not be inevitable as it was made out in this uh, important piece of work. What they did is they introduced another heuristic, uh, which many people talked about. It was called the lexicographic heuristic. And the lexicographic heuristic does this. Uh, it first looks at the most likely outcome, which is, a, uh, which is 100 with probability of 1. And it's 100 with a probability of 89%. And then what it does, so it identifies what is most likely to occur, and then it says, I'll take the one that is best. In other words, oh, here I get 100, and here I also get 100. Eh, doesn't help me, doesn't help me to make a choice. So what I do next is I look at the second most likely outcome, which is in this case uh, this outcome. In the other case, it remains the same. Uh, and then I compare 500 against 100. Clear, uh, option B is much better than option A. That's the lexicographic heuristic. So what... Um, this authors did, Payne, Batman, and Johnson, they said, well, it could well be that this kind of strategy that looks at the most likely first works in some environments really well and not in other environments. And what they were, and they manipulated various environmental structures. We only look at one, which is the most important one. Uh, what they were considering is to what extent the heuristics may be, their performance may be a function of the variance in the probabilities. And uh, what they distinguished were low probability worlds and high probability, uh, sorry, high variance worlds and low variance worlds. A low variance world is one 
where all the outcomes are about equally uh, likely. And the high variance world is one where you have one outcome, for instance, one outcome that occurs with a very high probability and all other outcomes are much less likely. And here's what they found. What they found is that the lexicographic heuristic is really successful in high variance outcomes, uh, high variance worlds, but not in low variance worlds. And the difference is really substantial. The difference is about 20 percentage points. Um, the opposite regularity holds for equiprobable. In other words, the equiprobable heuristic really works well in worlds where there is little variation in the probabilities, but it works substantially less well if there is uh, much variation. Which suggests, by the way, that maybe as the ideal decision maker, adaptive decision maker, what you should do is that if there is high variance, go with lexicographic. If there is low variance, use equiprobable. However, what's also true is this. Overall, across all the environments, there was a front runner, and the front runner again was equiprobable. In other words, if you don't know anything about the probability structure, uh, it's a good idea to bet on equiprobable. Equiprobable performed much better than lexicographic, but still, there was a substantial price you pay. It's still uh, only just 79%. I should say, uh, one second, uh, this again is still in a world of risk and decision uh, from description. It's still in the world of risk. Yes, please. How was performance evaluated? Is that compared to expected value ma maximization or as prediction? In, it's not prediction because there is no prediction. Uh, because it's the world of risk, all the information is given. But the benchmark was expected value maximization. Yeah. Okay, so, yes. Uh, hi. Um, is there any evidence that humans actually use any of these heuristics in this particular case? Because I would think, well, you have an intuitive feeling that option B is far better. Uh, um, so, so that's really my question. Obviously, I can understand that in more uncertain situations, mm. we would use these heuristics. But in mm. this particular case, mm. is there any reason why we would? Um, there's a, that's an interesting question, because if you look at the um, literature, you have two strands of literature in risky choice. And one strand is what's called process tracing studies. Process tracing studies are studies that try to understand what is the psychological process people are using. And then there's the other literature which is not so much interested in the process, but really in the outcomes, in the choices, whether they are following, for instance, the maxims uh, of expected utility theory. Uh, and these two camps don't talk too much to each other. If you look at the process tracing strand of the literature, then there is evidence that people use heuristic methods. That doesn't mean that they use one specific heuristic, but they act in and search for information in ways that is more consistent with the heuristic processing than, for instance, with expected value processing. Yeah? So in other words, I cannot tell you that there's lots of evidence that people use exactly that or another heuristic, but I can tell you is that the process tracing evidence suggests that people are using heuristic processing strategies. Okay, okay but, but here is still the problem. The problem is, hmm, we're still in a world of description. We're still in a world of risk. There's no learning, Every, all information is given to you. And here comes the question. Should we expect that it makes a difference if once we move from risk to uncertainty? And um, you talked about uh, heuristics yesterday, and mostly you talked about inferential heuristics. In other words, you talked about heuristic where there's a, a, a real objective criterion in the world and we can judge the performance of a heuristic. And what you have found, and there are many examples, or what you have heard, and there are many examples in this book, is that simple inferential heuristics can do really world, uh, well, and under some circumstances, they even do better than complex models. And what you learned yesterday in Gerd's talk is that a key to understanding why that's possible is this bias variance dilemma. And let me quickly uh, recap that. So the idea is, that, is this. Any prediction model, heuristic, complex strategy, whatever, consists of two components, makes an error that consists of two components. The bias uh, part, the variance part, and the noise part. 
Let's ignore the noise part for the time being, just look at bias and variance. And what you see here on these two targets is basically a prediction model that has a, a very specific bias, namely shooting always to the lower right, but it has very little variance in its predictions. Uh, whereas in this case, you have basically no discernible bias, but you have lots of variability. Now, variability or variance is basically an indicator to how sensitive a prediction model is to the specific properties of the learning sample that you have drawn from the environment. And the higher the variance part, the more sensitive the model is. And a more flexible model, which means a model that has more uh, uh, adjustable parameters, will usually suffer from higher variance. It is wonderful because it can also capture the underlying true structure in the world that I want to predict, but it's also capturing the noise part. And that is the trade-off. Uh, and the trade-off means that typically in heuristics, you have a very strong bias, a relatively strong bias. Think of equiprobable. Equiprobable basically says that it's his theoretical bias. All outcomes are equally probable. That's very strong. But it has very little variance because there's not much that you need to estimate. Uh, other models that have more flexibility, uh, they typically uh, have uh, uh, much less of a bias, but they suffer from the variance part. Now, here's the question. Could it be, in all the studies that we looked at, Thorngate and Payne, Batman, and Johnson, what we did is we kind of reduced the variance part because we gave all the information about the environment to the decision maker. And what we do as a result of that, we basically favor the more complex models. And we disfavor or disadvantage the heuristic models because the heuristic models, they still have the strong bias and they don't get the benefit from the lower variance part. That would be one hypothesis, one expectation that we may have. Now, is that true? Uh, with that, let's uh, that's what we did. So what we wanted to know is what happens to the whole results about choice heuristic once we move from the world of risk to the world of uncertainty. Here's what we did. We, like Thorngate and Payne, Batman and Johnson, randomly generated lotteries. They con could consist of two, four or eight outcomes. And they had two, four or eight options. For the time being, I will just focus on the part where we have two options to simplify uh, the results. And unlike Thorngate, we had 20 different environments. Uh, we had a total of four different probability distributions and four different outcome distributions. And we teamed them up. And as a result, we had 20 different environments. We wanted to basically implement all kinds of different possible structures to see how these heuristics perform in different structures. And then here comes the important part. Now we introduce uncertainty. So what we tell the heuristics, the decision maker, is you know nothing, but you get to sample from the world. You can sample one time, make a choice. You can sample two times, make your choice, three times, make your choice, up to 50 times, which is quite a bit, and each time you make a choice. So we could see, as a function of the reduction of uncertainty or the level of uncertainty, how would the heuristic choose? And what we did is we also looked at total, a total of 20 different choice models, heuristics, expected value theory, cumulative prospect theory. That's all too complicated for the time being. I will just focus on heuristics and expected value. That's all we are looking at. OK. So here's what we do first. Uh, we go to the Thorngate environment, which, which is just one out of the 20. The Thorngate environment is the rectangular outcome distribution and the rectangular probability distribution. And we will look now at three heuristics, equiprobable, lexicographic, and least likely. And we compare the performance against expected value, but we force expected value to sample too. Expected value is no longer omniscient. Expected value has to sample from the world as everybody else gets to do. And then we wanted to know, so what is the performance? And uh, what you see here already is, uh, the average, is, is the average performance now in terms of average expected value of the chosen alternative for two, four, and eight outcomes as a function of whether you sample five times, 20 times, and 50 times. And what you see is uh, basically expected value uh, learns very quickly but originally, it's of course not perfect. 
and it has to learn more and it takes longer uh, the more outcomes there are to be learned. So if you have eight outcomes, it takes quite a while uh, to learn before it reaches almost the level, the perfect level of an omniscient, of an omniscient expected value theory. In other words, once you force expected value to be also learning, it's no longer perfect. Uh, but it reaches uh, very quickly a perfect level with after, not quickly, after having sampled 50 times. Now, how well does, uh, does equiprobable perform to that? Remember, equiprobable in the original simulation seemed to be quite good, but there were still the hefty 25 percentage points. Um, how does it look now? This is the performance uh, of equiprobable. And what you see now is that uh, the difference between equiprobable and expected value, once expected value samples, is much, much smaller. And in fact, if you look, for instance, here in this case, it even is the case that the performance can be distinguished anymore. And remember, this is a model that doesn't look at probabilities. It ignores probabilities altogether. And under some cases, you even see that equiprobable is slightly better than uh, expected value, in particular when the sample size is very small. Uh, this is the performance of lexicographic, which is worse, and the worst one is least likely. Now we can also, uh, we can ask the following question. We do know from the Payne, Batman, and Johnson simulation that equiprobable performs well when the variance in probability is small, right? That's what we know. So the question here is that, ah, that's interesting, but it's just a, a one-trick pony, right? I mean, this would not hold across all the 20 environments. That's just not very likely. Uh, and that's the question that we wanted to address ne next. Is the equiprobable heuristic a one-trick pony that only works in a Thorngate environment? And it will falter once we put it in other environments. So what we did next is we looked at all 20 environments. Uh, they are now very different. And again, it's the same idea. We compare these four strategies expected value has to sample and learn from the environment. Uh, and we can, and, and what we did now is uh, we expressed the performance now, uh, we normalized the performance, and basically the performance is expressed on a, a percentage scales. 100% means that the strategy always chooses the best option. Zero means the strategy always chooses the worst option. And 50 means the strategy samples uh, randomly. We had to do that because now the values in the environment were very different. We had to normalize that. Uh, and this is the performance uh, of expected value. If there are two outcomes, this is the performance if there are four outcomes, and this is the performance uh, when there are eight outcomes. And it's basically the same result as before. When there are more outcomes, it needs more to learn. It takes a little bit longer. It takes longer until it reaches the top performance. And the top performance is really good. So after 50 times, 50 sampling, it's almost there where an omniscient expected value model would be. Not surprising. That, that's, that's to be expected. But what about equiprobable? Uh, equiprobable now reaches this performance. And we can also quantify that by saying that the difference between expected value and equiprobable is at this point 3.4 percentage points. In other, words, in other words, once we move from risk to uncertainty, the heuristics do, ex do substantially better than in the world of risk. The difference, the gap, the performance gap reduces, and not only that, if you look at the condition where uncertainty is very high, my sample size is very small, you actually see no difference at all. In other words, if you know very little about the environment, if you know very little about the environment, you are uh, as good off ignoring all probabilities uh, than using expected value maximization. Now, because we manipulated outcome and because we had many different outcome and probability distributions, we could also ask this question. What properties of Joyce environment support which heuristic? And what we did is we looked both at the role and impact of outcome distributions and the role and impact of probability distribution. And I will simplify that. Let me tell you that the outcome distribution doesn't matter. 
it doesn't change the performance of the U stick. What matters are the pro is the probability distributions. Uh, and uh, what we did is that we looked at lower variance probability distributions, a rectangular, usually, I, I, I don't bother you with the details, so all you need to know is that we looked at lower variance environments and higher variance environments. And what we found is the following. This is a lower variance environment, the rectangular uh, probability distribution again, thorn gate. And what you see here is basically the learning curve, now in much more detail, for expected value, which needs to sample from one to 50 times. And that's the learning curve. Uh, and what you see is that once you have sampled 50 times, you almost reach top performance. Now let's compare that in that environment to equiprobable. That's the learning curve of equiprobable. And what you see is that there are, uh, there is a, there's an area of uh, uncertainty where equiprobable actually, where you are better off using equiprobable than expected value. Only at the very end, it is the case that expected value performs better than equiprobable. But in this range of the twilight of uncertainty, the twilight of knowledge, uh, you may be better off doing expected, uh, doing equiprobable and ignoring probabilities altogether. That's, le that's a lexicographic strategy. And now we, of course, are interested in will that change if we change the variance. And what you see here is four uh, environments, uh, two environments which have lower variance and two environments that have higher variance in the probability information. And what you see is when the variance is lower, it's always the case that equiprobable is as good as expected value, sometimes outperforms it. Lexicographic is worse, substantially worse. And if there's higher variance that's turned around, then suddenly lexicographic outperforms equiprobable and equiprobable is worse, right? So we find, in other words, we find again under uncertainty the same thing that uh, Payne, Batman, and Johnson found. However, remember overall, overall, equiprobable is by far the best strategy. If you don't know anything about the environment, pick equiprobable over the lexicographic strategy. Okay, with that, let me come to the conclusions. So what I wanted to show you and convince you of is, uh, we, yesterday you talked about inferential heuristics. Uh, and inferential heuristics, in particular when they have to deal with uncertainty, can be really good. And sometimes they can be better than uh, complex models. And this is not only true for the inferential domain, it seems to also be the case for the preferential domain. Um, they can be surprisingly accurate, and the interesting point is that this level of accuracy is much higher once you deal with experience, once you deal with uncertainty relative to dealing with risk. And that has something to do with the bias variance dilemma. If you don't know anything, then pick the best, the pick equiprobable, because equiprobable is the best heuristic both under risk and under uncertainty, and it's a strategy that paradoxically ignores all probability information. It treats all outcome the same. And under limited knowledge, remember in a condition where only five times has been sampled, under limited knowledge, this strategy outperforms expected value maximization. You are better off ignoring probabilities if you know very little about probabilities than trying to capture than trying to catch them. Um, the key environmental property is variance and probabilities. If the probability variance is high, then equiprobable drops in its performance, but it's relatively fat, uh, fat, <laughs> flat, <laughs> uh, then this is a really good model. Um, here's a final point. I wanted to actually talk about this simulation as well, as well but there is no time. But we found something similar in strategic games. Uh, and Leonidas is sitting here in the back. He's the, uh, he's the mastermind behind that simulation and work. And what we found there, so what we did is that we used one-shot strategic games. And in these strategic games, uh, you have to make a prediction about your opponent. You need to predict which of the two possible strategies the other person is using. And that requires making assumptions about the other person also, for instance, rationality assumptions. And what we found is that the most robust heuristics that perform better than Nash equilibrium, that perform better than Nash equilibrium, are strategies that uh, weigh 
the, op the strategies of the opponent equally. In other words, that make no assumptions, they, they assume that both strategies are used with equal probability. In other words, there seems to be something really fundamental about how we deal with probabilities, and there seems to be something very robust about assuming, about assuming indifference, about assuming equal, uh, uh, equal probabilities in the world. Um, last but not least, and I will stop here, um, what does, what does that have to do with uh, Peterson and Beach and Kahneman and Tversky? Um, maybe you have a suspicion now what it could have to do with uh, these two set of authors. Uh, and if you are interested, we can talk about that in the discussion. Thank you very much.